Welcome to the Open Forum. Again, we have the opportunity to look together into the Word of God in order to discover truth. Now again, we want to, before we get into the program, we want to uh, talk a little bit about what's going on in uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico. Uh, we again have a group of individuals, 22 in number, 11 men and 11 women from various parts of the United States who are there to distribute various tracts that Family Radio has produced to warn those dear people, as we're warning the whole world, that Judgment Day is almost here. And on the other hand, that there is still a marvelous number of people still becoming saved. Uh, we read here, and I'm just going to give you a few highlights from the, some of the communiques that we've already received from them. Uh, they uh, call themselves uh, the uh, ambassadors for Christ. And as I've explained at other times, uh, in Second Corinthians chapter 5, we read in verse 20, Now then, we, that is every true believer, is an ambassador for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. Be ye reconciled, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. And you know, in, in these days when we're, to, when we're warning the world about Judgment Day and, and bringing the truth from the Bible that is not being offered in the churches or, or uh, the way it ought to be, uh, we're, we've learned from Jeremiah 51 another way in which God speaks how I, I t totally identified the true believers are with Christ in His work. We read in, in Jeremiah 51, where it, in verse 20, God is talking about His, His assault on the, on the kingdoms of Satan, the uh, spiritual Babylon, and that as they are, uh, as they are finally going to be destroyed during the day of judgment. And he says, Thou, speaking to these ambassadors, uh, that is the true believers, Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war. In other words, God uh, again and again pictures the body of believers as an army. And, uh, and even when we send out uh, 22 people to be ambassadors of Christ in Puerto Rico. It's really an army of God that is there uh, to, uh, on behalf of God, to warn about the end of the time of time, and also to offer the wonderful possibility of salvation uh, uh, as they wait upon the Lord. But just to give a couple more verses the, from Je Jeremiah 51, Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war, for with thee will I break in pieces the nations, and with thee will I destroy kingdoms, and with thee will I break in pieces the horse and his rider, and with thee will I break in pieces the chariot and his rider, and so on. And that's exactly uh, uh, the way we are to understand Second Corinthians 5, where God says, God was in Christ reconciled the world unto himself, and now then we are his ambassadors. Or really Christ is saying, with thee, with thee, I, that is Christ, is going about the business of bringing the message of the gospel, including the warning of Judgment Day. Well, that's, let's get back to our, uh, our ambassadors in Puerto Rico. And uh, we read here the tracts uh, that we plan to proclaim the gospel of Christ to the people here during the uh, next ten days by distributing thousands of family radio tracts and hundreds of Bibles in the Spanish language. That's the dominant language of Puerto Rico. The tracks were printed locally and contain the current family radio broadcasting schedules for this area. That is one of the 
great blessings of these track distribution activities because the tracks are left there in that city, in that uh, state, or in that country, and uh, they uh, all have a life of their own. They can uh, uh, be passed from one person to another, but in the process, those who uh, uh, who read that track can also learn how they can continue to listen to the family of uh, fa family radio programming on shortwave or whatever other radio is there or on internet if they have a computer and so they there is a continuing blessing that can come uh, from listening to family radio because that track team has been there and uh, they in turn those who are are encouraged by the tracks they in turn can tell others about how they can continue to listen we uh, and then it goes on uh, we are uh, the the tr uh uh, we have a total of 150,000 Does God Love You and Judgment Day tracks and 150 Spanish Bibles uh, in our hotel, and we can order more as needed. We also have many booklets and CDs of Family Radio's Bible teaching materials. Now, what is Puerto Rico? It is a self-governing island commonwealth of the United States. In other words, it has the same standing as as uh, our states have, located in, in the northeastern Caribbean. It lies east of the Dominican Republic and west of the Virgin Islands. Do you know where it is now? <laughs> well, anyway, if you're looking for it on a globe or on a map, you, that'll help maybe. It has a population of about 4 million and is composed of a main island of Puerto Rico and a number of smaller islands. San Juan is the capital and largest city with an official population of about 500,000. And uh, but it uh, the total number of people on uh, in the metropolitan area of of Puerto Rico is about two million. It's about half of the of the state of of uh, Puerto Rico. And it's just another little note. It was founded by the Spanish colonists in 1529, 1521. What does that remind you of? In, 19, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. <laughs> I remember that from, from grammar school. And, uh, and, uh, of course, uh, eight, uh, uh, 1521 would be 29 years later after he got back to Spain and reported about his trip. Uh, they, uh, Spain established a colony there, and that was the beginning of population by Europe of the, and the Spanish people, particularly of Puerto Rico. Although, uh, today it, it is, uh, uh, it is uh, um, it is uh, 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 as I've indicated. It is a part of the United States. The official languages are are uh, Spanish, which is spoken by the majority of the population, and English is also understood by virtually everybody that's 15 years or older, and about 80% uh, 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 of the people identify with some kind of a Spanish descent, and um, uh, 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 most of the others uh, identify with uh, something from an African descent and other minorities. The principal religion is Christianity, Roman Catholic variety, about 85% of the people are Roman Catholic and about 10% are Protestant. Now, as they have be, begun to pass out the tracts, they, uh, they uh, uh, f uh, had had already many interesting experiences and, uh, and, uh, uh, and again, they're finding that the people are very, very receptive to the tracts. Uh, as, an, as an illustration of how this is going, they were in one city. They not only uh, pass tracks out in Puerto, are passing out tracks in Puerto Rico, but also in other cities that are 
that they can get to. And they were in one fairly large city. And there was a, uh, they arrived at a large arena where they had seen hundreds of people. And it turned out that these people were lined up to purchase tickets for a musical concert of the heavy metal variety that is slated to uh, air next March 12, 2010, about three months away from here. But there's a great interest in this. Many of the uh, of us view heavy metal music as virtually being of the occult with satanic overtones and undercurrents. But today the, bas- the ambassadors uh, saw the hand of God turning the hearts of these people as he would will to do that because the reception was surprisingly excellent. You, you can imagine what kind of people these normally are that are interested in heavy metal music, uh, but the, the, uh, it, it was surprisingly you know, ex- excellent. In fact, a group of these young men, upon receiving the Judgment Day track, declared, Wow, we were just talking about this. And uh, that is, I think, probably, I'm speculating now, but I think this is probably true, you know, the film uh, 2012 is uh, making a lot of headway in the world and has lots, has uh, uh, made a lot of people talking about Judgment Day. Now, of course, that 2012 movie is a fairy tale that has no truth in it at all. Uh, but nevertheless, it is serving a very, very wonderful purpose in alerting or uh, ident- or uh, indicating to people, listen, there is a judgment day coming. It's not going to be 2012, but you keep listening to what Family Radio is teaching, and, and as the people hear about this from Family Radio, and then they tell their friends and and uh, these friends tell other friends, and so more and more people are learning that the Bible comes with the truth, and it isn't 2012, it's May 21, 2011, and it is absolutely certain to happen. So we're, I'm, I'm personally very grateful that that film has been produced, and even though it is, there's no truth in it. And so we're also... These ambassadors, our our team that is in Puerto Rico is all also hoping that many of these young people, particularly that are here, are listening, are interested in heavy metal, (laughs) you know, with all that uh, relates to, that that God might turn some of their hearts to Christ. Then they uh, were in another market and, uh, and, uh, uh, they found a very interesting thing happening. They uh, were the the uh, that uh, that there were many preachers from various denominations declaring their kind of a gospel. Uh, this was on Sunday, including the Charismatic Church, was which was conducting a healing ceremony, and of course they were all advising the shoppers not to take these tracks and not to believe this false gospel that they claimed we were, uh, that that they claimed was the kind of a gospel that our people were sharing. But wonderfully, instead of this being a hindrance, hindrance to the distribution efforts, it was quite the opposite. Because by God's mercy, more people were taking the tracks than they were before the preachers arrived. In other words, they were wondering, why are these preachers so against this? And again, maybe they had been talking about this film, 2012. We can only speculate about that. But but they're really curious. What is this all, what does this have to do? Uh, we do notice that Puerto Ricans, which is true in any Roman Catholic country, Uh, And that is one of the big blessings of the Roman Catholic Church, even though it has so many doctrines totally wrong. Uh, But they did instill a fear of God uh, to those who were were, uh, 
avid uh, churchgoers or really believed in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, and they do have a fear of God, and that's a good starting point for listening to the truth of the Bible. And, we, and this is what our people are experiencing wherever they go. Or if it's a Roman Catholic country, there is a, a, a reverential fear of God, which we don't have in our country. Oh, my, my. It's hard to find anyone who really uh, trem trembles about God at all. But anyway, that's another subject. Uh, one, one lady, when given the tract to open this, her side pouch she was carrying, uh, to put it away. Uh, our team member saw that she had quite a few tracts in there. And when asked how it is that she had so many, she said she was picking up the discards wherever she could find them uh, to take uh, back to her village to share with her family and uh, friends. My, my, isn't that wonderful that, that uh, while uh, the, the reception of the tracks was very, very excellent, even the few that are, uh, were thrown uh, and were not picked up by the ambassador themselves, uh, were still being picked up so that they would not be useless. They would be be uh, uh, be uh, truly still valuable. Wherever the teams went, they were warmly received, and uh, and uh, 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 and practically everyone took and held on to the tracks and teaching booklets. We praise the Lord. This, Letter goes on for inclining the hearts of these people to receive the precious gospel that provides eternal life to whom God wills. And so we also thank God that the very good reception rate was is maintained uh, all around uh, every hour that we are distributing the, uh, distributing the tracts and in each city that we are going to as well as San Juan, which is the uh, chief city. I, there was one, uh, one other little note I wanted to make, make note of uh, as one of the highlights in these letters. In a, in two of the best, uh, were, they were in old San Juan, old San Juan, the old, old part of the city, and that is where the, uh, the uh, cruise ships stop. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, uh, a couple of our people went to the wharf and distributed tracks to tourists who were disembarking from a cruise ship. And what a wonderful great greeting that was for these tourists. They, instead of receiving some native trinket, these dear people, as they step off the ship, are receiving the transforming message of hope. And this is a message that crosses international borders because these tourists are from every corner of the globe. And uh, they were giving them so rapidly, we depleted the majority of our track load that we were carrying at this location. And we expect more opportunities uh, to do this. Well, there is our... Uh, our uh, our first report that we're giving and and let's pray for these 22 people who are uh, working so uh, assiduously so seriously so intent intently to get as many many people acquainted with the end of the world as possible and let's pray for the people of Puerto Rico that uh, that many of them might be included in the 200 million that we believe will be uh, raptured on the last day. But now we're going to go to our program, and so shall we take our first call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hi. Hello? Uh, go ahead, please. Oh, my, we're not getting that caller. I guess we'll have to go to our next caller. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hi, Father Camping. Um, I would like to ask you a question. Yes, go ahead with your call. Okay. Um, what does it mean when Christ is in the form of an angel? Like, I saw an image. It was on a card, like a Christmas card, and it was a drawing 
uh, well, well, first angel, all, and it looked like Christ, and it had the bird on its wing. Like, yeah. what does it mean when it ha when you say like Christ has healing in his wings? I've heard you say that before. Well, first of all, I. And what not... does the bird mean? Is that the Holy Spirit? No, excuse me. First of all, uh, Christ is not an angel. Angels are created spirits, and you cannot make a picture of a spirit. All these pictures you see on postcards or on Christmas cards are just man's imagination. It's impossible to make a picture of an angel because they are a spirit and they are not uh, God. Uh, the word angel in the Old Testament is, is the word messenger and in the New Testament it is the word messenger. Christ is spoken about as a messenger. He is the a messenger of the covenant and and uh, sometimes in the bible that word messenger it's translated the uh, as the word angel but if the context shows that it's talking about Christ we would never never use the word angel we would use the word messenger just like people are messengers of the gospel but we're not angels we're not related to angels the angels are a separate Creation. We read in Hebrews uh, that they were created uh, to assist God in his salvation program. But we don't know just how we assist. We do know, for example, that they were shouting or singing the praises of God, Christ uh, on the morning or on the evening that he was uh, uh, born to Mary. You remember the shepherds were out in the field and there was a multitude of the heavenly host. They were angels. And they were singing the praises of Christ. But shall we take... And so anything that you see on that angel, a bird, or whatever it is, forget it. It's just the imagination of man. Or can I ask you, what does it mean, the bird on a swing? What does that... What is that, the Holy Spirit? They said the, in the bird landed on its wing. Well, I don't well, know. The Holy I, I, I don't Can you explain, know. explain I, the, Holy, the bird on the wing? The angel, is, and again, we're not to try to make a picture of the Holy Spirit. That is God himself. Uh, but uh, the Bible... Well, the bird on its uh, but, wing is God but himself? What, they, what the one that designed that picture what they thought the bird was I have no idea I have no idea uh, we do know that the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus when he was baptized as, as he was officially announced as the one to uh, show us how he paid for our sins and to bring the gospel uh, prepare for the church age the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus as a dove uh, that that dove represented the Holy Spirit but uh, that whole business of of trying to represent the Holy Spirit is is a terrible thing because the Bible insists we're never to try to make a a representation or a picture of God, just like a picture of the head of Jesus is a, is a real monstrosity. It's really something in rebellion against God, and we should not do that. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. How are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Uh, I was wanting to share with your readers uh, a couple of uh, passages from Proverbs and then ask you about the second. Uh, the first one is 21.16. Proverbs 21. Let's take a look at that. Proverbs 21.16. The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. Yes, that's a very, very uh, interesting statement. The one, the the, uh, the way of understanding is, of course, the way of learning or understanding the Bible correctly. And if we go down a wrong kind of a path, then we are 
in the congregation of the dead. We're amongst those that will be entering into the day of judgment in another 17 months, uh, plus a couple of weeks. They're going to be entering into the day of judgment unless, by God's mercy, it, this, their God is still saving some people, but it's only a tiny number compared with the whole human race. But what is your other verse? Uh, yes, that one that one jumped off the page at me, and the other one is uh, Proverbs nineteen twenty. And well, go ahead and read that. And I was just curious about the uh, the last two words, latter end. But uh, Proverbs nineteen twenty. Yes, that the latter end is definitely speaking about our day. The verse says, Proverbs 19, verse 20, Hear counsel. Now, where do we hear counsel from? From the Bible. From the Bible. Uh, we in Family Radio are trying to give counsel, but not our counsel. No way. It is simply that we're trying to tell you, share with what we have discovered in the Bible, so that you can uh, find that in the Bible. Uh, 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 it says, uh, hear counsel and receive instruction. And this has to do with instruction from God, which we get from the Bible, that thou mayest be wise in the latter end. Uh, and that we're, we're in the latter end of the world. And the wise are those who have become true believers. Those who are not wise are those who will who are part of the congregation of the wicked, that is, uh, uh, therefore, they will enter into the day of judgment. Thank you for sharing those verses. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Camping. I have a question regarding uh, the various verses that churches, throughout the church age, Churches emphasize these verses for, as their interpretation of what describes hell, a place of punishment. And you're saying, of course, on October 21st, 2000, that's so, the end. Excuse me. Could you speak a little more into your phone? I'm not here uh, understanding what you're saying. Okay. Try again. Yes. Um, throughout the church age, churches use certain verses in the Bible is, as their interpretation of what describes hell, a place of punishment. But you're saying October 21st, 2011, that's the end. So just wondering, what happened to the souls of the unsaved? We're looking at, say, Matthew uh, 22. I'll explain that right after this message. Could you hold on for just a minute? I'll be back with you. A line that's asking a very good question because there's a lot of misunderstanding about this. Where do the souls go of the unsaved people when they die? You, you, what gets confusing is let me let me explain this for just a little bit. So because this is a very very good question, uh, man was created body and soul. Body is flesh, just like an animal. Uh, we are we we are, we are like an animal with the breath of life. But in addition, we were created with an soul which would live forever had we not sinned. Uh, and, but the moment that mankind sinned, when they died, they died body and soul, unless they became saved. Now, if we became saved, then we are given a new soul, which is eternal in character, that new soul, in our new soul, we will never die. We will live everlastingly in the new heaven and the new earth, uh, serving the Lord Jesus Christ. But if we do not become saved, we read in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. When an unsaved person dies... He is dead, totally dead, body and soul. There's nothing that continues. Never again will he have conscious existence. The only thing that will still identify with anything else is that on the, on the, the first day of the day of judgment, his bones or his 
corpse or his dust, whatever is left of him, will hear the voice of God to rise up, to resurrect, in order that that person might be shamed in the eyes of God for all the sins they have done. But that person won't have conscious existence. He will not come to life in any way at all. It will simply be that his bones will be obeying the command of God or his corpse or whatever is left of him. But uh, he himself is, it will never know that is happening because he has no conscious existence. Therefore, when anybody dies, and every day uh, 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 a lot of people die, if they did not die as a true believer, their life has ended forevermore. They will never, never experience any further punishment. That is a huge punishment because... They have died and have been deprived of the most awesome future that comes to those who become believers, namely to be with Christ forevermore, co-heirs with Him of the new heaven and the new earth, reigning with Him over whatever God has appointed for us forevermore. It's, it's a fabulous, fantastic for a future that we can't even begin to understand. But nevertheless, if we died unsaved, all of that is gone. There's no possibility of that. And that is a, 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 a part of the punishment, uh, the biggest part of the punishment that comes to the unsaved, that they're deprived of that inheritance. And the other part uh, base, uh, is the shame that comes upon them when their bodies are thrown out of the tomb. And the other part is that they ha are dead, that they are dead and will never live again. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. How are yeah. you? Very well, thank you. Uh, I'm David, Brother Camping. I'd just like to thank you very much for doing such a wonderful job. Uh, Brother Camping, I recently had a tremendous problem with a neighbor who slandered me, and I uh, wonder if you can offer some help from, for example, Proverbs 24, 28, and 29. You want to look at Proverbs 24, 28, and 29. Let's look at that. And also chapter 25, 18. Proverbs 24, verse 28. Be not a witness against thy neighbor without cause, and deceive not with thy lips. Say not, I will do so to him as he had done to me. I will render to the man according to his work. Now, what is your question? Well, may I just ask you to help me understand how when a neighbor slanders someone and brings, you know, tremendous uh, shame and problems, Brother Camping, and also 25.18. Well, uh, in, in Proverbs 25.18, a man that beareth false witness against his neighbor is a maul and a sword and a sharp arrow. Well, now, uh, first of all, it's dealing here with the neighbor and what he is doing when he is slandering someone uh, or reviling someone or speaking falsely of that person he is god is teaching here this is a horrible sin just like he names uh, hundreds of other things that are sin but how am i to react against this i i have a neighbor and he's bad mouthing me let's say and trying to make me look like a uh, something awful in the eyes of others around, what am I to do? Am I to try to get even with him? The answer is absolutely not. We are not to revile. Remember when Christ, what it says about Christ, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. We are to take it patiently, considering the source. We should pray for that individual. Remember what Jesus said? Pray for those who... Well, let me see if I can find a verse on that. In uh, Matthew, in Matthew, I think, about chapter 5, we read there... Uh, 
Matthew 5. Uh, love, verse 44, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. To curse a person is the highest form of and most terrible form of slander uh, when they are trying to uh, make you look like like something awful. Uh, uh, bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh the Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Now think, think of this. Here are people all over the world today who are thumbing their nose. That's an old expression to indicate uh, absolutely uh, hating and speaking badly about someone. And they're, they're, they're ridiculing the Bible. They're paying no attention to it. They're mocking the Bible. Does God immediately begin to, uh, to, uh, 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 make, uh, 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 destroy them one after the other and take away the warm sunshine? No. They can still live in this world like other people can. Uh, this is, uh, God is, is showing us that, all right, they do that, but they, there'll come a time, there'll be the day of judgment, or there'll come a time when they die, uh, and that'll be a penalty for their sin and uh, their loss of the of an eternal future in the new heaven and the new earth that uh, they'll experience all of that will wait upon the lord he the law takes care of all of that but in the meanwhile we are to love our neighbor we are to pray for him and you know what you might do you have a neighbor that is slandering you perhaps have your wife bake a nice apple pie or buy a nice one uh, from some place there and uh, and bring that over just as a gift say hey you know we uh, my wife uh, loves to bake these pies or this cake or whatever and uh, i thought maybe you would enjoy one too and don't make a big fuss about it just just bring it over and and uh, then go back home again and leave that alone uh, but 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 uh, don't take the bait. When he says ugly things about you, don't react. That's what he's waiting for, is your reaction. He wants to start a, a quarrel. He wants to start a fighting with you. And don't take the bait. This is true of husbands and wives. Your wife or your husband says something uh, uh, terribly wrong against the wife. Well, all right, wife. You bake a nice dinner, make a nice dinner, uh, go out of your way to be extra nice and say, Honey, I love you. <laughs> but you just keep, Honey, I love you. And and you'll have a hard time dealing with that. And in the meanwhile, you will be having opportunity to demonstrate for yourself that I, I'm trying, I really have my greatest happiness when I'm doing it God's way. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening, Hal Camping. I have um, two questions for you. If a person was not saved from the foundation of the world, can God change his mind if a person prays for his salvation? Can uh, uh, God change his mind about saving if someone? If prays for his salvation. No, that's all been done. See, God's salvation is was in, completed. All the payment was made for the individuals that he planned to save before he ever created the world. He already yes. knew what their sins were. They were put on Christ, and he made payment for those sins. And so there's no way, none whatsoever, that someone that he had planned to save finally ended up not saved. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Brother Camping. Yes. My question is on Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, please. Okay, Proverbs 
Actually, I'm sorry. If you could jump also to verse 4, please. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 to 3 and 14. No, no, I'm sorry. Verses 1 through 4. Chapter oh, 1 to 4. 4. Okay. Proverbs 4, 1 to 4. Hear ye, children, the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. Uh, now, what father are we to be listening? A father in heaven. Father in heaven. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also, and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. Now, what is your question about this? My question is on... Um Verse three, where it, where it said, I, I, my fa- I was my father's son." Yes. Is this is this um, Solomon referring to David, or is this? Uh, 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 yes, Uncle- probably uh, as a type or picture of Christ, because Christ, of course, is the giver uh, of every good and perfect gift. The Father, He is the Father. Our heavenly Father is the giver of every good and perfect gift. All instruction finally comes from God, and uh, and yet God is using typology here uh, to, even as we are to, if we have a God-fearing Father, a someone who is is instructing us in the in the Word of God, we are to listen. We learn from Him. God has placed Him there to rule uh, over us and to teach us. But ultimately, as we are listening to Him, it's because. We want to listen to God uh, in heaven because He ultimately is our heavenly, uh, is our Father. He's our heavenly Father. Brother Campion, um, um, my question is: Could this be um, the Lord Jesus Christ referring to the heavenly Father? Because the end of verse four it says, "Keep my commandments," and I don't think uh, Solomon. Um, sorry, yeah, Solomon has any right to say he has commandments. Well, it's not... I, I, don't, I don't know who God might have in view, except he's setting up a hypothetical case. Now, here, I was my father's son, tender and only beloved, in the sight of my mother. Now, that, that means that uh, uh, God is looking at uh, uh, both parents as uh, representing... Uh, uh, just like the law of God says, honor thy father and thy mother. And it's talking about, ultimately, the uh, our father and our mother gave birth to us. Uh, they were both involved in this, of course. And it is God who gave birth to us. That is, he is the one who created us. And so, ultimately, it goes all the way back to God. I thought uh, perhaps in the final, my final comment, um, and I'm not trying to, of course, the debate, this is how I, I thought it might have been, that maybe he was referring to the Father as God Almighty and the Mother Mary, and it, 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 in, in the midst, this is Jesus that is uh, 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 referring no, to the, only, and the Father only, and the Mother. Yeah, the only Mary doesn't enter into this at all. She doesn't enter into this, uh, uh, but we do find that we have a, we're the only place where it speaks about a mother, spiritually speaking, is uh, that I'm aware of is in Galatians, where uh, speaks. Uh, let me turn to that a moment. Yeah, I think it's Galatians chapter four. Galatians chapter four, where we read uh, that. Uh, Galatians chapter 4, where it says that Jerusalem above is our mother. Uh, in uh, in uh, That's in Galatians chapter 4, verse 26. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Now, the, that, that there, Jerusalem is typifying the kingdom of God, and the essence of the kingdom of God is Christ. He, and so it finally goes back to God. But uh, uh, if you want to talk about a spiritual mother, you, you have to think of in terms of Christ or in terms of the kingdom of God that, that uh, identifies completely with God himself. 
But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. Hi, Father Camp. And um, I called earlier. I don't want to know about the Christmas card. I want to know about what does it mean when Christ is in the form and he has the bird on his uh, wing. Uh, excuse me. Did you call already tonight? Yes, but I want you didn't answer my question that I wanted to know the answer for. Like, what does that represent? The Christ yeah, well, excuse, has the bird on his wing. Me. Who is that? Is that Christ? Excuse me. We talked about that together, and uh, and remember, I gave you the answer that the, if uh, the only thing in the Bible that it could identify with uh, would be the, the Holy Spirit, and that is absolutely anathema. That we should never, never make a picture of anything pertaining to God. The Bible says, uh, in, uh, let me read from Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. And please don't, uh, I would encourage you, do not become fascinated or, or interested in any way in that picture of an angel with a bird. Uh, just erase it from your memory because it's all, it's all contrary to the word of God. We read in verse 4 of Exodus 20. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above. That would be an angel or, or uh, the Holy Spirit or Jesus or, or anything uh, from heaven that is in the, uh, 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 or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. And you know, today, people are worshiping angels, they're worshiping, uh, they believe they're worshiping God, and then they want to make a, an, an image of some kind. Don't get, uh, don't pay any attention. If you happen to get a Bible and there's a picture of an angel in there, just cut it out. Just don't leave it there in your Bible. That uh, we, You don't want anything to do with that. But now, thank you for calling, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. Uh, I would like to bring out an observation basing on Matthew 24 and verses Mark 13 about uh, no one knows in Matthew there are two different knows in Greek uh, one is 1492 which is hoiden which means from what I understand is um, a future knowledge and uh, the Gnosko 1097 on the con in the concordance is an experiential no, such as the no in um, Matthew, uh, where uh, it says that Joseph didn't uh, and, know and Mary. Uh, and in Matthew, until, it is the first no, is it not? Uh, Matthew verse... It is not experience, it tw is... twenty-four, Chapter 24, verse 37, and uh, thir verse 39. Can you read both, please? Yeah. Or just read 37 to 39. Uh, well, Matthew 24, verse 37, But as the days of Noah show, so shall also be the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, that were eating, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, this has nothing to do with knowing, uh, knowing, uh, 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 but, but the fact is, whether, whether God uses either word, knowing, although mostly, uh, I think in almost every case, uh, maybe all the cases, the word knowing is a word that means to, uh, to have knowledge of, not to experience. Although the word know that uh, you to have experience, uh, like, for example, Jesus knew uh, or, or excuse me, uh, uh, Joseph did not know Mary and, uh, uh, until after Jesus was born, or words to that effect. That word no means he did not have, ex have a experience and inner uh, any relationship with Mary until after 
Jesus was born. And that's experiential knowledge. But it makes no difference. The fact is that Christ said very plainly in Acts 1, it is not for you, he's speaking to the beginning of the church age, to, uh, to know times or or. Uh, uh, or, or, or now I have to read that I have to find it so I'll quote it correctly it is not for you to uh, X1 to, for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power and whether we uh, whether we understand that as experiencing or just simply having knowledge of it he says it's not for you to know and so we don't have to argue with the question. We don't even have to be concerned about the question. We simply know that during the church age, which ended in 1988, there nobody, nobody uh, on the face of the earth could know when the end would be. There were many who, have, who tried all through the uh, history of the church age, but they were always wrong because God here said, you will not know. But on the other hand, when we come to our day, because of the new information that has come from what uh, uh, had been sealed in the book that, uh, that Daniel wrote in the Bible because he had been given that information from God, he quoted uh, uh, God in the Bible, and then it was sealed up. And when that was open uh, uh, at the end of the church age, now we... No, he is coming as a thief in the night for those who are not listening to the Bible. But for those who are listening and who are watching, he will not come as a thief in the night. We will have knowledge of the time of his coming. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, how you doing? Very well, thank I a, you. I have a couple of questions. Um, what is the purpose of life? If if we are saved before the foundation of the world, what is our purpose? The purpose of mankind living is to bring glory and praise to God. Uh, when we, for example, and I'm I'm talking about people in general not here's someone who's not elect of God he is he's living and he becomes more and more aware of how great this universe is he becomes more and more aware of all the multitude of of living forms that he are in this world the billions of <coughs> of insects and animals and birds and and uh, uh, so on that uh, that are have been that are on the face of the earth, and it, 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 it all of this came into existence because Christ spoke and brought it into existence, and it is the role of mankind to praise God for such a marvelous universe. For and then every morning again and again he has a lovely day of warm sunshine, uh, and he that he should be praising God because God is the giver of it. That is why mankind was created, and uh, and if he di and if he praises God for that, even though he's not a child of God, he will find that this life is going to be. Ha relatively happy for him even though when he dies that's the end but uh, while he lived he, it was a, a very a very pleasant experience uh, living on planet earth ordinarily right. um, my second question is um, why is it so difficult to understand that um, Satan was one time Lucifer, but now all of a sudden he's the father of all lies. Where did that evil come from? Where did, where did it all start? Why is it so difficult to understand what? Would like, you repeat that, please. Satan was once uh, uh, God's angel. Like, 
the, the best. Oh, that best word, friend. that word, Lucifer, is not. That has been. A, that's an absolutely wrong translation. That should never, never, never have been put in the Bible. It is uh, it literally when we understand this passage, we find that it it means that uh, he was. Uh, let me see. Uh, he it, it, that verse goes, "How art thou fallen from heaven?" Uh, uh, he, uh, oh, oh, dark Lucifer, oh, uh, mm, or, 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 it's talking. Or, excuse me, it's talking about the 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 king of Babylon. And that verse should have been translated, How art thou fallen from heaven? You uh, you are boasting that you are son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground? His name is not Lucifer at all. Ho- hold on, I'll be right back with you. We have a caller who's uh, bringing our attention to Isaiah 14, where uh, the translators incorrectly, absolutely incorrectly, translated... Uh, this as it's talking about Satan. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? And because that's in the Bible, uh, we uh, all kinds of theologians and believers have attributed uh, the idea that somehow he was a very great and wonderful angel before he fell into sin, and and uh, uh, he had the uh, name son of the morning but all of that is not uh, as because it was incorrectly translated actually it is indicating here that he was an angel with an enormous pride he wanted to be like god in verse 14 i will ascend above the heights of the clouds i will be like the most high and so he boasts, not O Lucifer, that's not anywhere in the Bible. Oh, he boasts, son of the morning. In other words, he's boasting, I am the son of the morning. It isn't that he is. It isn't that he ever had been. He is simply boasting. He wants to be like God. Son of the morning would identify with the Lord Jesus. He is the one who is the son of God who who rises as the sunshine with healing in his wings. And so it's an entirely incorrect translation. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. How you doing, Brother Campbell? Very well, thank you. Yeah, could you uh, go back and... I'm sorry, you have to speak right into your phone. Let's try it. Okay. A couple of weeks on the open on the open forum, you spoke about how when G, when God was in the flesh as Jesus and he came across the the uh man with the demons in him and he said and they the demons asked, Have you came to the No, excuse me, I have to interrupt. I'm not able to follow you. If we can't do better, I'm sorry, we're gonna have to go to another caller. I, uh, I really don't like to give you up, but we just have a bad line, I think, so we'll have to go to our next caller. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, go ahead with your call. How are you, Brother Campbell? Yes. Um, how are you today? Well, I'm very well, thank you. Okay. And when we read uh, in Exodus 20 about the Sabbath day and Isaiah twenty six twelve. Is there I, a parallel? No, Exodus twenty and what uh, uh, uh remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy and yes, what and, uh, and Isaiah twenty six twelve. Isaiah six twenty six. Twenty six. Verse twelve. All right, let's look at that. Isaiah 26, verse 12, we read, Lord Jehovah, thou wilt ordain peace for us, for thou hast wrought all our works in us. O Jehovah our God, other lords beside thee have had dominion over us, but by thee only will we make mention of thy name. 
why are you interested in in uh, Isaiah 26 in connection with Exodus 20? It's because we, we, we not to do any work for salvation because Christ has done everything for us. Well, uh, that's not that's not indicated in in Exodus in Isaiah 26. But let me let me uh, give you a verse that does emphasize that. That's Exodus 31. In Exodus 31, we read uh, in verse 14, "Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you." Or, or no, let me back up. Verse 13. Speak also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am Jehovah that doth sanctify you. Now, that is really a big piece of information. It is indicating that... God gave the seventh day Sabbath. You're not to do any work of any kind because it is a sign. It is pointing to a spiritual law that God is, has done all the work in making us pure or making us holy or paying for our sins or saving us because all of that is identified with the idea that he has done all the work to sanctify us. And that is saying, and that's why it says in verse 20, in verse 14, You shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. In other words, now remember, it's a sign you're not to do any work of any kind. And if you do a little bit of work on the seventh-day Sabbath, uh, 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 then it says, For whosoever doth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Now, what's it pointing to? That Christ did all the work to save us. If you take, try to take any credit for yourself, that you believed and therefore you became saved. You you asked God to be your Savior, therefore you became saved. You were baptized in water and therefore you became saved. Uh, anything at all, then it indicates you are still under the wrath of God. And God demonstrates that by uh, Numbers chapter 16, where the man who picked up some sticks on the Sabbath was put to death by the command of God. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Camping. I had a question. Um, Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 and 32. Let's look at that, Jeremiah 31, verse 31 and 32. There we are. Read. Behold, the days come, says Jehovah, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was an husband to them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall teach no man, every man his neighbor uh, and, and they shall teach no more, every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, says Jehovah, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Now, what is your question? You see, the fact is that this is talking about the way God is saving people today. He is not working through an organization like a church an organization like the nation of Israel. 
He is working directly uh, with each individual that does become saved. God does all the work, and uh, in, uh, and uh, He is the one who has con- charge of it. That's why Family Radio today, for example, we don't get anybody saved. Not at all. Not at all. Our role is simply to show people to listen to the Bible. Look, and we'll show you where to look in the Bible. Like we just talked about about the Seventh-day Sabbath and what that means. Uh, showing people that the Bible is, is telling us that God has to do all the work. All the work. And there's no priest, there's no preacher, there's no elder, there's no deacon... There's no evangelist that ever, ever saved anybody. Christ did all the work. And now that is demonstrated as Christ is saving people all over the world today. And we have no idea where they are or who they are. Only God knows. Right. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, Brother Kevin, yes. my question has to do with the birth of Christ. Uh, if Christ was born in uh, 7 B.C. and he was crucified in A.D. 33, that makes him uh, died at the age of 39, yes or no? He was born in 7 B.C. and he was crucified, he died at the age at 33 A.D. At that time, when we work carefully through the Bible, uh, we know he was within a few days of 38 and a half years old. Ah, most, most commonly, uh, it is commonly known that he was uh, he died at 33 years old. That it is commonly yes, I'm aware of that. That has been taught again and again and again. But it's because the one teaching, the, the, or the, because they have not, un, those who teach that have not understood Luke chapter 3. Yet in Luke chapter 3, there's a bad translation. It's a, it starts right uh, from the fact that they're working with our Bible, but the, but, but the, the King James Bible and every other Bible also. Uh, did not uh, translate this passage correctly. We read in in Luke chapter 3, it says in verse 23, And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. And that is an, an incorrect translation. In the original, it says, And Jesus was himself about 30 years beginning, having been supposed, and so on. Uh, 30 years beginning. And the translators assumed that that was his birth. That was his beginning. Uh, Why didn't they think of his uh, conception as his beginning? Then he'd maybe be a year older. But the fact is, uh, when when uh, when we work through the timeline of history, we find that no, that cannot be his beginning. That will not work. But we do read elsewhere in the Bible that out of Egypt I have called my son, and that was talking about the uh, typified by the nation of Israel that came out of Egypt. But it was pointing to Christ. And remember that. When Jesus was about two years of age, his family moved to Egypt to escape the awful wrath of Herod, who had just killed all the babies around Bethlehem trying to get trying to kill Jesus. And, and to escape his wrath, they fled to Egypt. Now, uh, it was about four years later uh, that, that Herod died. So that means that Jesus was at least six years of age when he left Egypt with his family to take up residency in Nazareth, which was in Israel. And, uh, and that was really his beginning. It was his, uh, the beginning was not in, uh, in uh, 
seven B, uh, when he was born in seven B.C. His uh, his beginning was when he came out of Egypt, which was uh, six or seven years later, and uh, that is when we factor that in. Then we find everything harmonizes that he was he was uh, thirty eight and a half when he was crucified. Okay, uh, one other question. Uh, I mean, not a question. Uh, you know, the, the the King James also has a uh, uh, comment that uh, it says he, he was born in uh, four in in four BC. You 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 see that in the King James? He was born. No, the King James the King James Bible has uh, we're, we're, you know. Well, he was not born in four BC at all. He was born in seven BC. And where the King James, the I, the Bible doesn't record 4 B.C. any place. Uh, it, uh, but the, but the uh, the theologians, based on what they read in the in the King James Bible, think it was 4 B.C. Right. Thank you, Mr. Kempin. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Kempin. Yes. Um, um, I know you've explained this probably a hundred times, but could you uh, explain again um, how how I think there, you said there's three or four different tribulations and how they kind of relate to the tribulation of our day, like Jacob and then all and all of them, please. Yeah, first of all, they are tied together by the number twelve hundred and ninety. Remember Daniel chapter twelve. It speaks about the abomination of desolation, or and the taking away of the uh, of the uh, uh, the. Uh, well, let me let me read that. Let me turn back to that. Daniel, chapter twelve. It's uh, it speaks there. Uh, it says. Uh, uh, from the t- verse 11 and from the time that the daily shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days well the Bible allows us to think of a day as the year God gives us examples of that in several places and when we go from the, fir- the first tr- uh, se- uh, picture of the great tribulation it is when Jacob, who was the grandson of Abraham, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Abraham had come to the land of Canaan as the promised land and was given that land to, as an eternal inheritance. It was really a picture of the kingdom of God that would go on forever and ever. But the physical land was was what he was told to look at. And uh, and so Abraham, and, and then that was repeated to Isaac and Jacob, and, it's, and uh, so that family, beginning with Abraham coming, uh, until finally uh, Jacob was told to leave to go to Egypt, they had been there for 215 years, and then Jacob, because of the famine in the land, had to leave uh, the land of Canaan uh, with his whole family and that was the promised land it was a terrible terrible thing that he had to do it was like abandoning the kingdom of God and that was in the year uh, 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 1877 now I'm quoting these from memory and I hope I got that right 1877 B.C. It was the second year, at the end of the second year of a terrible famine that lasted for seven years, and he had to go to Egypt to to escape uh, that famine because his son Joseph had been brought there to provide food for the, the people of that day. And that famine lasted seven years. So we have uh, in the end of the second year, and, and the, the whole famine was seven years, and that was a time of great tribulation to Jacob and all of Israel of that day. But in the second year, at the end of the second year, 
in other words, the famine had been going for two sevenths of the time. It was the time when it was of greatest trauma for uh, for the family of Israel. Then, exactly 1290 years later, in the year uh, uh, 587 B.C., there was another horrible thing going on. The nation, the nation of Judah, was being assaulted by by the king of Babylon, by by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And in the year 1877, the uh, Jer- Jerusalem itself was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. It was a terrible, terrible time. And that period. Of of these of this kind of thing happening began in the year 609 B.C. or 22 actual years or or 23 uh, years inclusive, and it continued for 70 years. It went from 609 B.C. until until 539 B.C. Now it's uh, it was almost. Uh, in, at least in the language, was a di- directly parallel in time to the uh, uh, two sevenths, the, the two whole years as compared with seven whole years for the whole family. Here we have 23 years inclusive as compared with uh, with uh, uh, with uh, 70 years for the total amount. In both instances, the number seven is strongly featured. Now, two times 1,290 years after that, there was the actual Great Tribulation uh, to which these two that we've spoken about were pointing. And that began in the year 1988, at the end of the Church Age, and continues all the way to 2011 exactly 8400 days and the first part of it went uh, for uh, for uh, 2300 days or 2300 out of the 8400 and so it was almost the same proportion as the other two uh, two famines or the other two tribulations that were types and uh, and uh, it was at that time that it was the worst part of it because at the end of the first 2,300 days of this 8,400-day Great Tribulation, uh, again, God began to save people all over the world, the final final harvest of souls. But in the churches that make up about a third of the population of the world, that horrible situation that began in 1988 continues. Satan had been installed there to reign and uh, to rule, and he still does. And the Holy Spirit had abandoned those churches. And so, whereas in the, in the re, in the rest of the world, God began to save again in the churches. No one is becoming saved. It is as horrible as it can be. For the churches, just as it was super horrible for Jacob when he had to leave, uh, actually physically leave the promised land, just as it was a super horrible time in Jerusalem when it was actually destroyed and the temple was destroyed. It couldn't have got, gotten worse. And again, it's on that same kind of a uh, proportion, about uh, approximately two sevenths of the way through. And so God has given us these types of the of the, the great tribulation. There's one other type, and that's the seven months that the ark uh, that the uh, ark of the covenant was in the land of the Philistines. But that is not nearly as as uh, d- uh, well developed. It's still a picture. It's utilized later on in Revelation, where it talks about. Or, or in uh, in uh, Ezekiel chapter 39, where it talks about seven months, uh, that is the tribulation again, but uh, it's not nearly as as well formed or ty- typified as it is in these other two. 
But thank you for calling and sharing. And you know, we're right in the end, near the end of that great tribulation. The Bible shows without any question that when we come to the end of this, and it will occur on May 21, 2011, after exactly 8,400 days of tribulation, uh, uh, which is exactly 23 whole years, when that comes to an end, then... There will be the rapture, the catching up of all the true believers, and it will be the day of judgment uh, for those who are left behind. And, oh, that's going to be a horror story that has never, never, never been experienced by planet Earth. But shall we go to our next caller, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, Brother Campy. Yes. Could you go to Gen- Genesis uh, 32, 22 to 30? Genesis 32, verse 22 to 30. Let's see what that is talking about. Genesis 32, verse 22. All right, this is talking about... Uh, Jacob is on his way back from Haran with all of his family and all of his goods. He had been 40 years in the land of Haran, and God had blessed him mightily. And now he's ready to meet Esau, his brother Esau, who he left 40 years earlier. And Esau was uh, was uh, ready to kill Jacob at that time because of Jacob's uh, uh, having stolen or uh, 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 taken the uh, the the uh, blessing out of the birthright away from Esau, and so now they are crossing the Jabbok River, and there Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let you go, Jacob said, uh, to the one that he was wrestling with, except you bless me. Jacob sensed that this was God himself. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob, which incidentally means supplanter, because he had uh, supplanted his brother Esau in uh, and he tried to supplant him when he was born. He took hold of the heel of Esau, although Esau was the firstborn. And now uh, he had supplanted Esau in taking away the blessing, which he, which God had to, was going to give to him anyway. But that identified with the name Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God, and with men, and has prevailed. And Jacob asked him, and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou ask after my name? And he blessed him there. Now, what is your question? You mean wrestling with God? He wrestled with God. And, of course, God, in a split second, could have... Uh, th- uh, could have absolutely conquered Jacob, but God allowed this because he is teaching Jacob a spiritual lesson. We've come to the end of our time. Uh, I'm sorry. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you.